Hi, I'm out here today with my 71 Avanti 2 at the Ypsilanti Orphan Car Show. It's the 16th annual show, and I've been uh, one of the folks that work out here in the mornings, my 16th year, and it's a lot of fun. I've had other Studebakers here, and this year is the first time for the Avanti. Pretty good turnout. We have about 31 Studebaker vehicles here, about 270 vehicles overall. Weather's somewhat cooperating, kind of wet this morning, but it's uh, dried up and it's still a little chilly, but a nice day and a very popular show and real glad to be here. This is a Studebaker SH touring car and this is Richard Coleman from Celine. Now, Richard's here every year with some kind of a car or another, so tell us about Richard's car. We appreciate him coming. Uh, where was this car built, you know? It was built in Detroit. That's one of the things I wanted to say is that uh, most people think of Studebaker and South Bend, Indiana. But up until about 1921-22, Studebaker actually built more cars in Detroit, Michigan, than they did in South Bend. Gradually, uh, uh, Studebaker production was moved to South Bend. They came back in the early 30s and built the Rockney small car in, uh, in Detroit, and that was the end of that. Well, the history of that Detroit plant goes back to uh, the EMF, Everett Metzger Flanders car, which was uh, bought, the company was bought by Studebaker and Studebaker dealers who were primarily farm wagon vendors at the time, sold EMF cars, and then it became Studebaker EMF and finally pure Studebaker. Okay, go ahead, Richard, pull her ahead. Thank you for bringing it. Now this car that's rolling up right now is absolutely a spectacular car and of course he's here every year. As a matter of fact, I think one year he got the best Studebaker award. Am I correct? Um, this is uh, Larry Garden from Quincy, Michigan. Him and his wife Pat, they, they bring these Studebakers everywhere and this is a 31 <laughs> President State. Uh, most of us, uh, at least people the age of Jeff and mm -hmm. I and younger, think of Studebakers as economy cars, but uh, just in the dawn of the Depression and as the Depression was reaching its uh, zenith, Studebaker was building some rather expensive cars. They weren't quite in the Packard Cadillac or Lincoln class, but they were a notch below something akin to one of the senior Buicks. And of course, the President's state was the best of the best. It had a 366 cubic inch straight eight engine. Uh, the, you notice that this car has uh, wood spoke wheels. If the customer wanted steel or wire light type wheels, they were available. Uh, Studebaker also had uh, always, uh, I think Jeff would probably agree, somewhat leading edge styling. Uh, notice the parking lamps on the uh, fenders. It sort of looked like uh, sugar scoops or something. Uh, nobody else had anything like that and just uh, the whole car has a certain elegance about it. Notice also the add-on uh, trunk that we've like we've talked about earlier. Sir, this, this is a CCA full classic too, isn't it? Yeah, so this is the not recognized by the Classic Car Club of America as being a genuine classic car. Thanks for bringing it. Let's give him a round of applause. Now, we've got several Studebakers that are similar vintage body styles. We have a long, long line. I'm going to ask you to pull way ahead for me. Follow me, sir. That's it. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. I want you to stop right about here. Keep coming. Keep coming. We're going to get as many of these vintage Studebakers that are similar in body design in a line together. Just keep them coming, gentlemen. Keep them coming. Keep them nice and tight. Uh, I can only run so fast, so I'll do the first three, and then I'll toss it up to uh, Jim and, and Jeff. We're going to start with a 49 Studebaker champion four-door. This is Gerald Mitchell from Southfield. Behind him is a spectacular convertible. This is a champion convertible, a 49, and this is Bob Hutchins from Linden, Michigan. And behind him is a, well, I'll tell you, I'll just do these two for now and then we'll do these. Go ahead, guys. Well, there was a race among some car manufacturers after World War II to be the first on the market with an all-new car. Thank you. Uh, many think it was the first all-brand-new car that didn't know, owe anything to the past was the 49 Ford. No, it w some people say it was the 47 Studebaker. 
Actually, it was a uh, the 47 Fraser, which, which, which was designed by Graham Page, but I think the Studebaker was in production before they built Frasers at Willow Run. Um, this was the new the new looking cars from Studebaker. Studebaker uh, had um, had uh, worked with Raymond Lowy. Raymond Lowy started out in the early 30s being the sort of the design consultant to the Hupp Motor Car Corporation and several Huppmobiles were designed under Raymond Lowy and when Hupp faltered he went to Studebaker and influenced the design on pre-war and post-war Studebakers. Uh, these were handsome cars, they were definitely new looking with the, uh, the, the front fender, front door surface uh, uh, continuous and with the outrigger rear fenders and the, the innovative interiors, they were uh, really well received by the public. Now, the comedian said that somehow they couldn't tell which way it was going. I've never understood that because to me it's perfectly obvious, but anyway, it was one of the standard comic lines in the, in the uh, late 40s when these cars were being made. Okay, gentlemen, roll them ahead. We got are. more. We got more coming in behind you, so we're going to let you two fellas go, and we're going to line up. We've got four or five of uh, similar vintage years, so we're going to line those up, and we'll have Jeff and Jim describe them. Pull right up here, if you would, please. Keep coming. Come right up to me. All right, stop right there. Come on ahead. Come on ahead. That's good. Now I'm going to run back to all of these. We got a '51 Champion two-door, and this is Steve Rohde from Ann Arbor, and uh, behind Steve is a 51 Champion two-door. This is Dave Holtz from Brighton. Uh, Dave, you got a beautiful car. I love that color. Uh, another 51 Champion Commander four-door. This is Ken Eisen Eisenmayer, and this is from Westville, Indiana. Thank you very much for bringing your car. And last but not least, we have a 52 Studebaker Deluxe Champion, and this is Mike Pulaski from Livonia. I know Mike's been here before. Thanks, Mike, for bringing it. Tell us about these cars, guys. Well, these first three cars uh, uh, represent the 1950 and 51 facelift for Studebaker. Uh, this uh, this propeller beat kind of uh, look. Um, uh, uh, Tom McHale, the noted the Mechanics Illustrated car tester, said it looked like, student, like Preston Tucker must have gone through South Bend on a bicycle. I never. Just a footnote, this car was actually produced in California. Oh, at Studebaker's Summit Land, California. Very good. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, the re the reference uh, because the the uh, Mr. McHale is because this car looks somewhat like the post-war Tucker with its with its middle and uh, uh, circle being uh, being a headlight were legal in some states. Um, it was a very radical design again under the design the leadership of, of Raymond Lowy. Very bold move, and it's it's a little bit difficult to see how. Iowa farmers accepted this car, but it was in fact the most popular post-war Studebaker. So people did like the look, they decided they liked it, and they bought a lot of them. And then and Jim's going to tell, tell us there was also a new V8 involved. There was, in 1951. Uh, if you notice the, uh, well they are 51 models, the 1950 which led off with the needle nose styling came in with two different front ends. The uh, with the big straight eight engine, the commanders and land cruisers required uh, an additional length to accommodate the engine and had longer hoods and fenders. When the V8 came along, they could all use the same front end as the light blue car is. And under hood was Studebaker's own V8 engine. It was a 232 cubic inch displacement, 120 horsepower. Uh -huh. And in 1950, mid-year 1950, Studebaker first became available with a fully automatic transmission. Uh, the, did you? Did we talk about the 52 mile? No, you're gonna bring that up. Okay, okay. All right, I guess that's. Who, about, who uh, built their automatic, Jim? Huh? Oh, the automatic transmission became available in 1950 at mid-year. I think origi originally only on the commanders and land cruisers. Who built it? Who built it? Oh, Bork Warner. That's what I thought. Yeah, Bork Warner uh, uh, did a lot of that uh, early work on automatics that wasn't done by GM. Okay, gentlemen, roll them ahead for me. Thank you for bringing your vehicles today. We really appreciate it. Let's give this group a round of applause. Now we're going to get into the more futuristic looking uh, design Studebakers. These are the ones that 
really were far, far ahead of their time. And of course, this gentleman that's rolling up right now is absolutely no stranger to the Orphan Car Show. As a matter of fact, this gentleman worked at Studebaker Corporation. And he owns it and has owned it since it was new. Come ahead. Come ahead, guys. Come on. Bring it right up to about here, if you would, for me. Uh, this is a 53. And where's your window card, sir? Is there any? That's what we need. Now, this is a champion Regal Coupe. And, of course, Ray Windecker is no stranger to the Orphan Show. Ray's from Livonia and helps us every year. He brings his cars, and we appreciate it. Behind Ray is a 53 Studebaker Regal Coupe. And this is uh, Charlie Saganak from New Boston. And Charlie's here all the time. I like the, I like the coffin nose cord better, Charlie, but we'll accept this. Thank you for bringing it. Tell us about these cars. Well, these were outstandingly beautiful cars. Uh, this, they were designed again under the leadership of, uh, of uh, Raymond Lowy. Bob Bork was the guy that really did the, the coupe body. Um, it's on a 120 inch wheelbase, I believe. So. Yeah, the same as the Land Cruiser sedan. Yeah. And they're just gorgeous cars. The complete antithesis of what a 53 Buick looks like. They've got low hoods, uh, low simple air intakes uh, for grills, uh, no chrome on the body side, the sculptured metal, uh, sloping trunk lids, very, very handsome car, almost a feminine looking car, very delicate, uh, refined, and European, that's what they advertise, the European look. It didn't translate as well into oh. the sedan on 115? Well, 116. 116 yeah, inch wheelbase, but, uh, and the land but uh, okay, this is probably really one of the it. loveliest cars uh, of, the, of the 1950s. Okay, Ray, pull her head. Now, in 1952, by the way, uh, Studebaker celebrated its 100th anniversary in the vehicle building business, having started in 1852 building wagons. Just a quick footnote on that particular design. Uh, in the spectator group today is a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Henchcliffe, who is a member of that Studebaker club and who has run a Studebaker that design at the Bonneville Salt Flats, of course it had a Ford engine, but it's the aerodynamics of the car itself that allowed him to run over 200 miles an hour in that style of a car. So here we've got a 57 Studebaker Scotsman. It's a two-door sedan, and this is Mal Malcolm and Kathy Risner from Albion, Michigan, and this looks about as plain Jane as uh, Studebaker as you can get. So go ahead and tell us about this one. I'm sorry, sir, you lost all your moldings on the way in. Um, Studebaker was very innovative. They weren't afraid to try things. And in 1957 and a half and in 58, they produced a car called the Scotsman. And it was available in a two-door sedan, four-door sedan, a station wagon, even a Scotsman pickup truck. And the idea was that they wanted to be able to sell the lowest cost, lowest price car in America. And of course, this meant, um, this meant, uh, painted hubcaps and no chrome on the outside and painted tail light bezels and a whole bunch of other things, but they were very successful. Uh, by the time they introduced this car, it was running 20 to 25 percent of Studebaker production, and it was what kept them going so they could hang on long enough to bring out the Lark in 1959. The Scotsman was derived from the Champion, which was their previous price leader. <coughs> I'm going to have these next three, which are similar. There's a little, a little spread in the years, but here we've got a uh, a 62 Studebaker Lark. This is Sandra, Sandra Studebaker. How about Sandra Studebaker? Let's give Sandra a round of applause. She's from Fraser. Imagine Sandra driving a Studebaker. All right, so get that card up. This is Bill and Sue Volt. This is a Wagoneer. These are the people that took the time to get out of bed and get here at 4 o'clock this morning to put up all these signs. Give these folks a round of applause. They can't hear, they're sleeping. <laughs> and last but not least, we have a 64 Studebaker Lark Daytona. This is Richard Gillies from Battle Creek, Michigan. Gentlemen, it's all yours. Well, we don't have an example, but in 1959, Studebaker, in order to survive, needed to have a smaller, more compact car. So they took what was basically their 1953 level mid-body and chopped off the nose and tail and gave us the Lark. And the Lark was an immediate success in 1959, uh, restored Studebaker to profitability, 
but it suffered a bit the following year when the big three announced their compact cars. Uh, by 62, uh, Mercedes-Benz had a, an arrangement with Studebaker and uh, they started to incorporate some Mercedes-Benz styling uh, features into the uh, front end of the Studebaker, as you'll notice in the gray car. Now the red car, he mentioned that it was a Wagoneer, but that Wagoneer is more than just a fancy name. There is a sliding panel above the uh, rear quarter windows that can be opened up so that if the uh, owner is uh, hauling uh, like a door or something from the lumber yard or even lumber, a grandfather clock, as Jeff says, uh, there's plenty of room to accommodate it uh, with the uh, sliding roof. I just want to know one thing, Bill. Is that roof leak? Yes, was the answer. Well, they're rather, rather reluctant. Well, there was a General Motors a GMC truck that had the same feature, feature uh, several years ago, I believe. And uh, they, w they went out, the, general, the GMC truck people went out and talked to Studebaker engineers who were retired in Florida and asked them how they, you know, how they kept, got the roof to not to leak. And Studebaker said, we never did. <laughs> the uh, high-mounted tail lamps on that uh, red car were also uh, somewhat unique in, in that period of time. It gave it a certain amount of pizzazz nobody else had at the time. We oh. got... Stop, we were talking about that car. Stop, just a moment. <laughs> okay, go ahead, guys. Back it up a little bit. Back up just a little for us, if you would. The judges want to get a closer look. Come on, back her up. Throw her in reverse. I know Studebakers go backwards. And we can tell which direction this one is going in, can't we? Uh, it's, again, Richard Gillies. This is a 64 Lark Daytona. We announced it earlier, but tell us about the Lark Daytona. Since it's a Daytona, it was built in, in South Bend, right? And, uh, of course, 1964 was the year the Studebaker, uh, end, of, end of 63, um, they decided to move their car production to Canada, which is not a big deal today. They make Chrysler 300s and Dodge Chargers and Chrysler uh, Town & Country mini, minivans in Canada, but back then it was like, it was like, oh my God, they're going out of business, which they weren't. But this particular car was one of the, the handsomest Studebakers post-war, in my opinion. Uh, it was uh, designed by uh, Brooke Stevens. Brooke Stevens was another consultant uh, to Studebaker, who also designed the uh, the facelift on the uh, on the on the Hawks. Uh, notice the beautiful front end with the dual headlights integrated into the grill. Uh, nice body side ornamentation, high tail lights. A very handsome car. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough, and the people who uh, wanted to stop the losses uh, moved the production to Canada, and uh, where it was where it was. It was there for the 64, 65, and 66 model years, with production ending in March of 1966 in Canada. Okay, sir, so you can pull it ahead. This does have a 289 engine in it, and no, it's not a Ford. Studebaker did make its own 289 model V8. Very handsome car. Thank you. Now, we've got about six cars that are very similar in design. If you'll pull yours up to here for me, we're going to get all six of you fellas in here together, I hope. Pull them up tight, guys. Stop right there. Come on up here. Come on right up here. Come on. Keep coming. Keep coming. Come on. A little more. That's good. Now, you and the gold Studebaker, drive here on the grass. We're not going to hurt a thing. Get over here. We're going to do something we've never done before. We're going to double deck you guys. Get it in here. That's it. Come on, pull it in. Pull it in. That's good. Come on, you and the red one, get up behind him. You and the black one, get right behind this car here, and we'll be, that's fine. Come on behind the red one, that's good. Now, if you folks will give me a moment, I'll, I've got my track shoes on today. I didn't wear any of Larry's shoes because I knew I'd be doing a lot of running. We've got a 61 Studebaker Hawk Coupe, and this is Don Delisle from Dundee, Michigan. Nice car, very nice car. Here we've got a 62 Studebaker GT Hawk, Gary Taylor from Sterling Heights. Uh, we've got a, we'll hold on to him, this is another 62, and this is a, a Gran Turismo Hawk, Warren and Kathy Goodlow from Livonia. Let's just do these three first, guys, and then we'll move to the 63s. 
Well, you can, the first car in line is the is the example of the more original Packard uh, Studebaker Hawk, which came out in 1956. They took the 1953, 54, 55 shell, and they did something uh, rather daring for its day. They put a, an exposed radiator grill, um, uh, made the hood higher, and, and made it look like sort of like a sports car. I wasn't sure when I was a kid that I liked that kind of look. It looked kind of old-fashioned, but. It did work. Uh, it did uh, allow Studebaker to uh, to build this same basic car from 1960, 1953 to 1963, and still look contemporary. Now, the, the white car, the silver car, and the gold car are the Gran Turismo Hawks that were redesigned in 1952 by Brooks Stevens, and uh, he took he took the fins off. He kept the same basic body panels. He kept the same hood with the grill. But added this, uh, what, some, what some magazines called a Packard predictor roof after the Packard show car, but really was a Thunderbird roof. And uh, notice the molding on the top of the fenders and runs a, the top of the fender to the top of the door to the top of the quarter panel. Very simple treatment, somewhat like the 61 Lincoln Continental. Um, a very handsome car, and it showed that this, uh, this facelift on a, on a 1960, 1953 automobile in 1962 could still be could still be uh, uh, successful in the marketplace. Okay, and, and the Studebaker dealers liked this car because they, they made money on it, even though they didn't sell all that money, but it was good to bring uh, people into the showroom. Okay, we're going to get to the 63s now. We'll get these 62s out of the way, and we'll move up to these fellas here. Um, keep going for me, keep going. Yeah. Okay, you and the gold, Studebaker, I want you to come right up here to me. Come on. That's it. We'll let the people in the bleachers get a good look. Now this is a 63 GT Hawk Coupe, and this is Tony and Hazel Olkowski from Michigan Center, Michigan. Now behind them is a spectacular, and I use the word for a reason, 63 Studebaker Hawk, John Begian, I don't know what city you're from, but tell me, John. Celine, well, you're very close. And, John, they thought your car was outstanding, and you're going to get the Studebaker Award. The judge's remarks were, this is a knockout stud, great engine package, Paxton blower, V8, great color and interior. So let's give John a round of applause, because John has taken the award in the Studebaker class. And I'm going to announce one more Studebaker behind him. This is a 64 Studebaker GT Hawk, and this is uh, Bill Pinock? Peacock uh, from Westland, Michigan. We've had a lot of typo errors here today, but that's okay. Tell us about these cars, guys. Uh, John, what's the engine package in your car, the plaque at the bottom of the fender? Supercharged, R2. R2, R2. okay. okay. And they had four levels of R, uh, each with increasing power in that era. Uh, well, one of them was two four barrels, wasn't it? And not a, not a supercharger. Okay, yeah. And that was 304 cubic inches as well, Correct. instead of 289. Notice the designers have just changed some grill texture and some of the uh, the way the uh, side grills are treated on the front fender. Uh, the 50, the 64 has a uh, line on the roof that you could have a vinyl roof uh, or a, a forward of that era. They also uh, smoothed out the deck lid on the 1964 model. The black 64 was the end of the Studebaker Hawks when Studebaker shut production down in December of 1963. Uh, that was the end of the Hawk and the Avanti and the Studebaker convertible and the Studebaker hardtop. Only selected models were built in the Canadian plant. Two and four door sedans, I believe. Basically, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, all of you gentlemen. Let's give John Beachin another round of applause. John's actually a Chrysler uh, engine engineering gentleman, so let's give John a double round of applause. He's your kind of guy, Jeff. Absolutely. And Chrysler still, since Chrysler is still around, praise be to God. <laughs> okay, now we're going to get into the Avantis. These have got to be my all-time favorite Studebakers. They're not a real Studebaker? No, the, the two that are coming up are a real Studi Avantis. I think Jeff will probably talk about Avanti too, but... Come right up here. We're going to get all of them up together. Now, where's your window card, folks? Yep, we need a window card. That helps. Um, here we go. A 63 Avanti. This is a real Studebaker. Hold on, Bill. Uh, this is Bill Kruger from Midland. I love this 
gray color here. This 64 Studebaker Avanti is owned by Fred and Donna Birdsall from Adrian, and it's just a gorgeous car. Behind that is uh, the Studebaker 2. We'll hold off on that and let you talk about these two first ones. Well, a guy named uh, Sherwood Egbert, a rather unusual name for an automotive executive, was hired by Studebaker uh, to set direction for the company. Uh, Mr. Churchill, who had supervised the um, introduction of the Lark, was pushing the company to do a four-cylinder car. Uh, this would have been a mistake because uh, the Chevy 2 came out with four cylinders and Ford was going to bring a four cylinder car out too and luckily they didn't because four cylinders had a very brief vogue in the early 60s and people went back to 6s and V8s. But the, um, another one of the, uh, what Sherwood sure Avery wanted was a glamour car to bring people into Studebaker showrooms and he worked with Raymond Lowy again with this Avanti which is built over a Lark uh, chassis. Uh, really an innovative car. I was stunned when I saw this car. I was especially stunned because it has no grill. The, all the air intake is below the bumper, which is quite common today, which was very radical in 1963. Uh, the headlights were covered, and therefore they were flush. Uh, it was a Coke bottle body shape where it, where it pinched in the middle, uh, reverse uh, uh, form on the rear fenders. It was really a very much of a glamorous car, and I understand the Mr. Kruger's car is all original, is that right, sir? The blue one? Yes, that's correct. All original car. Wow. Okay, you can pull the head, sir. Avanti's two were uh, reached the end of the line in December 1963 because they were no longer built by Studebaker after that. But the car did have an afterlife. Okay. We've got, uh, We've got a Studebaker man in this imitation Studebaker. This is Harvey Snitzer from Canton, and of course. Harvey's got several Studebakers, and he's very proud of this 71 Avanti 2 Sport Coupe. Uh, I like the mag wheels that on it. Uh, makes it look kind of cool. This is a 76 Avanti 2 Coupe, and this is Joe Pappy from Bloomfield. And Joe, we appreciate you bringing your car. I know you come here every year. Thank you for your patronage. Tell us, gentlemen, about these cars. Well, this this uh, this was uh, the Ivani was too good to die. They they got the chief engineer involved, and they they, they worked and uh, they found a way of producing small amounts of Ivani's after the death of the original Scudabaker Ivani. They called them Ivani's twos because did they have Chevrolet engines? Yes, Chevrolet they did. engines. And in order to accommodate the Chevrolet engine, they had to take the front end of the car and 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 raise it a little bit. So therefore, the the front wheel openings the relationship to the top of the fender is not the same on these cars as it is on the original Avantis. But still, they look very good, and the, there was a small market for them. And they went they, they went on and on with through different owners. Some there were some four doors that didn't look so good, and on various chassis, etc. But such was the magnetism, the magnetic attraction of the car that many people spent uh, many dollars over many years uh, keeping a, a form of this car in production. Okay, gentlemen, roll them out. We've got some really interesting Studebakers now. Studebaker trucks were always kind of a just like a little odd pickup truck, but they were in production for quite a while and they were pretty good workhorses. Pull ahead for me. That's good right there. This is a 59 Studebaker. This is a Deluxe 4E7. And this is Tony and Hazel Olkowski again from Michigan Center. We appreciate your helping us out. Uh, and behind that one is a uh, 61 Studebaker Champion pickup. This is Bill and Sue Volts again from Ipsy. Can you turn that thing off so we don't asphyxiate the crowd or won't it start? Uh, may not start. Talk fast, guys. Okay. The, crowd, the crowd's gasping for air. Okay, Studebaker... Uh was never a big force in the truck business, uh, but they uh, did very well immediately after the war and restyled in 1949 and basically kept that design going till almost the very end. The two-tone truck that we see in front of us was one of those. Uh, they adopted a V8 engine as an option in 1954. The, uh, the, the smoking truck uh, was introduced in 1960. Uh, it took its name from the Studebaker Champion, only shortened it to Champ, and that used Lark car sheet metal from the cab. Uh, the cab was derived from uh, Lark body panels, and the front end sheet metal was the same, but the grill was changed to give a more rugged look. 
The uh, full width style side uh, body was uh, actually made by Checker Cab and the same is used by Dodge. You might like to know that the when they were doing the uh, Ram truck, the first Ram truck with the current styling, um, they, um, the designers were looking at 1949 Studebaker trucks with the high hoods that dropped down to the low fenders and uh, they, they drew inspiration from those Studebaker trucks to do the latest uh, look in the Dodge Ram. We gave Bill and Sue a round of applause for all their work on signs. Now we can give them a round of applause for getting that thing out of here. <laughs>